Hey everybody, thanks for joining me uh, for this little show, this little show on the internet. The quilts must go on because they have to go on. What are we going to do if they don't go on? They have to go on. And uh, before I launch into a brief history of the American quilt, I want to say thank you. I want to say a big, big thank you to the International Quilt Museum. The International Quilt Museum is a place near and dear to my heart. Uh, I serve on the board there. Hopefully they'll let me serve on the board forever because I really, um, I love being involved there. And you can be involved there as well by becoming a member of the International Quilt Museum. The museum is in Lincoln, Nebraska. And the first time I entered the quilt museum, I wept. That's right, because there's there are a number of quilt museums in, in America uh, and they are all great. There's one in my hometown, the Iowa Quilt Museum. But there's something extremely special about the International Quilt Museum because not only does it have quilts that are very special to our American quilt story, it has quilts from around the world thus the international part. Um, they do fantastic talks online. They had the Ken Burns quilt exhibit. It's the only place that has had the Ken Burns exhibit was the Quilt Museum in Lincoln. And I urge you to go to quiltstudy.org, check them out, become a member. There's lots of stuff to do online uh, that until the, the museum opens again, um, after all this craziness, um, and just go check it out because the Quilt Museum needs your support and I, um, I would appreciate it if you would, and they would too. So thank you so much to the Quilt Museum. And I have to certainly give a shout out to the magazine that I edit, Quilt Folk Magazine. Uh, if you've ever seen Quilt Folk, you know that it is a very beautiful quarterly magazine. There are no ads in Quilt Folk Magazine. There are beautiful photographs of people. And we tell sto the stories behind the stitches is how we like to, to say it. Uh, Quilt Folk uh, Magazine comes out uh, yeah, four times a year. There's 164 pages, sometimes more than that, in every issue. And we travel the country state by state. And every issue of Quilt Folk features quilters and the quilt culture of that particular state. So we go on location and we meet quilters and we talk to them and we take their picture and we tell their story. We talk to modern quilters, we talk to traditional quilters, quilts of valor people, guilds, shops. I'm very proud to be part of Quilt Folk and uh, you should check it out. Okay, that's the business. Let's get in to the show. The show. All right. So this, uh, this talk, I've titled it A Stitch in Time, A Brief History of the American Quilt. Now, I'm going to be as brief as I can. There is a lot to cover, but I'm going to do the best job I can in the most efficient time possible. So we're going to gallop along. If you don't hear something you want to hear about that I don't talk about, I'm going to talk about it later. There's a million talks I can give on quilt history and really drill down deep into some of these topics. Um, but for now, it's going to be kind of a gallop, a gallop through 250 years of the American quilt story. Okay, so the first thing we have to do when we're doing a history of something, we have to ask ourselves, whose history are we telling? right? Because I have a perspective on history because of the things that I've read and the time in which I was born and who I am and how I was raised and so forth. But other people will have a different view of history depending on what they read or what they were told or how they grew up. So for example, when it comes to quilt history, there's a very famous couple of books that were kind of some of the first books about um, the story of quilts in America. Old patchwork quilts, uh, Ruth E. Finley, there she is. Oh, lovely. Uh, Ruth E. Finley wrote this book, um, put this book together. Uh, she also talks about how to make quilts. And there's another book, The Quilts, Their Story and How to Make Them by Marie D. Webster, another nice looking lady. They look lovely. And these are really important women to look to when we look at American quilt history because they made quilt history. Marie Webster was an entrepreneur who was like a total, total badass. I mean, I don't think they probably want me to say that Marie Webster was a badass, but she was. She was an entrepreneur who, who built kind of an empire in Indiana uh, back in the turn of the 20th century. That's her house there. The Quilters Hall of Fame is now uh, located there. And she was amazing. She's an amazing person. And Ruth E. Finley, Old Patchwork Quilts and How to Make Them, I mean, that book was in, in print for 
ever. So this is a, a woman who's writing a book and it was like evergreen content. So that's kind of a groovy copy of her book in the 1960s. You know, people were looking at these books for a long time to find the history that they were looking for when they looked at the American cult story. But the thing is, even though those books are really important and they're part of what we have to look at when we look at the story, we also have to say, what other parts of the story are there? And who else can we ask? Who else can we talk to? What else can we read about this story to make sure we're getting the full picture? Because the thing is, is as lovely as quilts are, as special as they are, as important as they are, and you know I feel that way because like I'm here doing this, right? Like nothing is more important or beautiful to me than quilts. Quilts are also fairly complicated when you look at their history because the reason that there were so many quilts in the 19th century, the reason they really exploded in the 1800s was because cotton, which is what you make quilts with, cotton um, agriculture was it really changed, okay? It really it developed in, in America in a way that's not always so pretty to look at. People who were enslaved in the South were picking cotton and not getting paid. Those were enslaved people uh, in the fields picking the cotton, okay? And that's how it worked. That's how we got so much uh, cotton in this country to be able to send up to the North, right? To send to the mills in New England so that that cotton could be turned into cloth. And kids, as you know, you've seen a lot of these pictures and you've seen the pictures uh, I showed you just before of the slaves in the field. Little kids were working in these big industrial machines. And like this picture, those are children going to work. They're not hanging out on the playground. They are going into a factory to work. So the quilts that we know and love, these beautiful quilts that tell uh, the story of America, they really do tell the story of America. And the story uh, of this nation is not always comfortable. It is not always one that we want to look at really hard. But I guarantee you, the more you look at it when you are fearless and searching in your view of who we are as Americans and the kinds of quilts that we make, the more you look, the less you shy away from anything that has to do with this tale, the more richly you will be rewarded. To avoid something that isn't pleasant, to, um, to skip over something that you think, well, what does that have to do with quilts? Um, you, you will, you will, you'll regret it. Um, it. You'll be impoverished, right? Because the more you know, the more rich and deep and important the story of quilts become, okay? So with that, I also need to say that we are talking about American quilts today. Um, like I said, with the International Quilt Museum, people make quilts around the world. People have been making quilted things since like you know, early Mongolia. I mean, this is a, a tradition that's gone a long time uh, and continues to, to happen. It's happening all around us. On the left, that's a Kantha quilt from India. Uh, on the right, and that's old. I mean, that's like, you know, 1800s, early 1800s. On the right, that's a quilt I am obsessed with. It is Australian. It was made in 1870. I mean, could you die? Could you die? I could. I love it. I wish I would have made it. We're not going to talk about it. I have to move on. We don't have much time. On the left, that is a Provençal quilt, beautiful butter yellow, you know, from France. Can't talk about you, honey. Sorry. On the right, a Bojagi wrapping cloth from Korea. It's fabulous. It's for another time. We're focusing on America, but that does not mean in any way that we are um, the only place in the world uh, where you can find extraordinary quilt history. So the point of all this, before we launch into the nitty gritty, the dates, the places, the people, the time, is that I want you to remember to keep looking. I have kept looking from the time I started being interested in quilt history. I continue to look and I continue to find things and it's because I look, I try to look at everything and ask as many questions uh, as people will allow me to ask. So let's get going. Let's begin at the beginning, part one. I like to call this origins and foundations. It's the origin of the quilt. Uh, and how we kind of got to today. We have to start here. So we're going to start in the 1600s because that's uh, when the colonists started coming over uh, from Britain. And we're starting there because uh, the indigenous people, before the colonists were coming here, um, they were not making patchwork quilts. They were not making applique quilts. We're going to talk about why. The quilt story does begin when you have colonists coming over from Britain 
where there were quilts uh, coming over here and then starting to uh, starting some of this history that we're talking about. Okay, I, talking about early America is really difficult because it's it's very complicated and it was terrible. It was a terrible time to be a person. Either you were uh, a Native American who was like having your home taken over, or you were a colonist coming over from Britain and you were cold. Everyone was cold and, and hungry, it seems, and it was just not a great time to be alive. See, she looks not like, she's not having a lot of fun. So people think that there were a lot of quilts in the early days of America, because it just fits the narrative that we've been telling ourselves for a long time, that the, you know the colonists didn't have any fabric, and so they were sewing these patchwork quilts together. But the thing is, is when you are um, living uh, without stores to go to, before you have the Industrial Revolution, which we'll talk about in just a second, before you have a means to buy fabric, you weave it. And this is true for all kinds of different cultures, right? We know there's lots of cultures where weaving is the main, the main thing when it comes to textiles. So can you imagine if somebody took your piece of woven cloth that you made in your home out of flax or wool from a sheep that you like raised from a, a lamb, if, if somebody came along and cut that up to then make into a different textile, like you would kill them. You would literally kill them. The early days of America, you had woven textiles. And so there weren't quilts like this. Okay, that lady looks really sad. I don't know that this is a painting of a colonist, but it, you know, it fits, okay? It fits the mood here. This lady is wearing cloth that has been made in that home or, you know, in her community. And that kind of quilt on the right, that would never happen. That comes later, this kind of quilt, because in the early days of America, you were not, you did not have a lot of fabric. And when you don't have like any fabric, you don't mess around with it to make like a fun scrap quilt and play around with your fabric because you don't have any. You really, really don't have any. Quilts are made when you actually have a whole lot more fabric, which we'll talk about, okay? So there were some quilts being made. The rich ladies, they were also cold and hungry. Everyone, it was terrible for everyone, but there were quilts being made. There, were, there still weren't quilts like this being made because they're still wasn't that much fabric. Quilts that came out of early America looked like this, and they were made by those like rich ladies in these rich households. And sometimes they had help uh, from people that were, you know, working for them for no money. And they, those people don't often get credited, but these quilts were being produced or they were being purchased from Britain, by the way. Little known fact, sometimes these rich ladies didn't even make them, they just bought them, you know? Um, so there's no, there's very little piecing in these early quilts because when you weave that length of cloth and you don't want to cut it, you just kind of quilt that. <laughs> you make a quilt sandwich, right? You put the top and the batting and the backing together to make your quilt sandwich and then you quilt those layers together and that's how you get a quilt. So on the left we have some piecing. It's, it's very rare you find a whole lot of like patchwork in those early American quilts but you know you know that that black fabric was like somebody was trying to make a dress and they completely ruined it or like a child like you know barfed on the black fabric or something and they're like fine just cut it up and like use it for something else and the quilt on the right a calamanco quilt it's whole cloth it's one big piece of cloth or a couple put together and then just quilt it that's the kind of quilts you had you also had chintz quilts just one more word about the early american quilts because this is important chintz quilts Fabric that you had that was printed in these early days, you had it imported. All of our stuff came imported from Britain. Tea being a good example, okay, the Boston Tea Party came a little bit later. Um, and you had fabric imported from England. And chintz fabric was coming from India. That's where it was made. So India, East India was making the chintz fabric, the beautiful printed, uh, almost like silk screened. They would like paint all the green on a piece of fabric, then they would paint all the red on a piece of fabric, then all the yellow. So you had this beautiful chintz coming from East India, and then it came to Britain. They had to buy it from East India or produce it in East India. Then we had to like buy it from Britain or we had to get it from Britain. So this stuff was expensive because when you go through that many, like that long of a supply chain, it's really expensive. So even the rich ladies had to make chins last. They wanted to get the most out of it that they could. So this is the birth of fussy cutting. My quilt people, they would fussy cut out, these chins quilt makers fussy cut out all those little motifs and they would then applique those motifs onto 
muslin to make the chintz go as far as possible because it was so expensive and it was really pretty. So you get quilts that look like this. These are classic chintz quilts. Sometimes chintz quilts, um, sorry, chintz fabric and patchwork was put together. You see more um, examples of this as we start to get more fabric in this country. And that happens because of a little something called the Industrial Revolution. And actually historians now call it the first Industrial Revolution because, well, you know, there's more that happened later that was kind of the second phase of it. Well, the Industrial Revolution, hmm, complicated, interesting, interesting time in our nation's history. There was good stuff that came out of it. There was less good stuff that came out of it. But no matter what you want to think about it, it changed the quilt forever. And it really, in some ways, birthed the American quilt. Roughly, when we talk about the first Industrial Revolution, we're talking about like 1760 to 1860. Like that's kind of the time frame we're going to use. Believe me, different people have different feelings on it. We can't talk about all the things that happened in the Industrial Revolution obviously the thing that concerns us here there's actually two inventions that are really important the cotton gin yes the cotton gin Eli Whitney I think probably everybody in public school system in Iowa anyway uh, when I was growing up learned about Eli Whitney's cotton gin and what was it in case you forgot well before the cotton gin cotton and seeds had to be separated by hand okay and we know that people who were enslaved in the south that's what they were doing they were picking the cotton pulling the seeds out what eli whitney's cotton gin did was it separated the seeds from the cotton like with a crank right like you could put the cotton in this gin and separate it a lot faster like a lot lot faster and so the cotton gin made cotton production go bananas like you could get a lot more <laughs> hot more cotton a lot faster. So the, the other invention that really pertains to what we're talking about here in terms of fabric and quilts was the spinning jenny. And you know, there's lots of kinds of cotton gins and Eli Whitney wasn't the first person and there's lots of kinds of looms like mechanized looms like the spinning jenny that um that really changed everything. I mean, you could start to weave that cloth. Remember that everybody was doing by hand. You could do it crazy fast okay so that's how those industrial um, uh, factories started popping up around new england these mills these textile mills it was happening in manchester england and it was happening in like lowell massachusetts right where a lot of fabric was suddenly being produced remember the, the days when we were getting it from from britain so like say a, a, a yard of cloth cost five dollars like when you were getting it from britain and you had to pay all the taxes on it and and you were trying to make a, a dang chintz quilt you know for once you were paying $5, say, a yard for that fabric. Because of the cotton gin and slave labor and child labor and those spinning jenny big industrial uh, looms and stuff, fabric went within a matter of years from being $5 a yard to being about five cents a yard. If fabric today dropped from like $12 a yard or whatever the ni real nice stuff is right now, if it went from $12 to like next year being like $8 a yard, and then like the year after that went to like three and a half dollars a yard, and then within a little bit more time was like 50 cents a yard, we'd go crazy. We would go crazy with quilts and they did. Little towns like Claire, Michigan suddenly had general stores and they had fabric merchants who were coming through town to sell this new fabric, printed fabric, printed cloth, cotton, wool, silk. I mean, it was crazy. It was an explosion of cheap, abundant fabric. And this quilt that we've been looking at, the Star of Bethlehem masterpiece, it was made by Margaret and Ellen Littlejohn, two African-American sisters who were enslaved by a family in Kentucky. They made this quilt, uh, and it's actually at, at the Met Museum. Uh, these days. And the Met doesn't have too many quilts in their collection. Hmm, annoying. But they have this one that is very good. So not everyone could get their hands on this much fabric. Uh, but if you're looking for fabric, you know, these people back in the day, for the first time, they could get their hands on some fabric a lot more than they could have before. If they could find a dress length of, say, like red calico, they could make a dress for themselves. Like no more wrapping fabric. They could like cut things and cut parts and cut pieces and have a seam allowance, okay? They could waste fabric to make a dress. Then they'd have some left over. They could make their daughter a dress and the daughter could make her doll a dress. And then you have all these scraps accumulating and the patchwork quilt that we know and love, okay? Look at all those different fabrics that are in that quilt. You don't make this kind of quilt because you don't got any fabric. You make it when you have so much 
you can play with it. Look at this quilt. This quilt <laughs> is, I love it so much. That's that red calico I was talking about. Look at all those string pieced um, parts of the eight pointed star. That is a person, a person who made this quilt had a whole lot of fabric left over that she could play with, okay? So when we look at these kinds of quilts and compare them, that is early American on the left. And on the right, you're talking about patchwork quilts that exploded in the 1800s because there was a lot of fabric. Just one more, because I freaking love this quilt. Look at this, 1860, people, 1860. Look at all those fabulous colors. What is that magenta? Why don't I, I want to make it, right? I want to make this quilt. I want to do it. So chintz quilts, patchwork quilts, you can see the difference. The last thing I have to say about this is that I was in grad school and I was working on a textile project and I studied this piece, this star in class and uh, this piece of loose patchwork, it's from Ohio in 1880. There are 90 different fabrics in that star, 90, nine zero. And it doesn't look like it, but believe me, I had to count them several times. 90 different fabrics in that quilt, in that, in that star. So hopefully that gives you an idea here in part one about how it happened, the explosion of quilts. And now we get into the 19th century and it goes really fast. You've done a really good job so far. Part two, let's do this. In order to get through all of these years of the 19th century, I'm calling this a quilt romp through the 19th century with Vince Vaughn? Wait a second, what does that even mean? I don't know. Vince Vaughn is not actually gonna join us for this, but I found a very emo picture of Vince Vaughn with a quilt wrapped around him on some weird rabbit hole quilt search that I was in, and I had to put it in somewhere. Okay, Vince is with us in spirit. All right, we're just gonna race through the 19th century, try to do this as fast as we can while still making it substantive. Okay, 1800s to 1810s, not a lot of fabric doing some, doing some piecing. It's happening, it's happening. There's a little bit here and there. We don't wanna ignore that. Got a lot of chintz quilts, they're happening. Patchwork is, 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 is showing up a little bit, but it's still a lot of uh, big piecing or no piecing at all. Uh, you've got uh, glazed quilts still happening, okay? In the 1820s and 30s, here's a, a broidery purse quilt. That means embroidery. And uh, if you're wondering like, what was the 1830s about? Well, Emily Dickinson was around in the 1830s. So that gives you an idea of like, oh, okay, that's what was happening in America, if you know about Emily Dickinson. Also, that picture is haunted. Let's move on. Uh, in the 1840s, you had quilts like this. Um, things are progressing. You can see things sort of changing in the American quilt story, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna move along because, oh my God, it's a quilt romp, okay? And there's a lot to talk about still. 1850s, this is a very interesting quilt. This is a quilt that was attributed to uh, a woman who was the mistress of the plantation down in the South, but it has been shown and figured out that it was actually made by one of her in her slaves, okay? So it was made by someone else and sort of attributed to another person. And this happened more than you'd think. And this is an important thing to look at because as we look at who's making quilts in America, maybe the, the people who were making them weren't always making them, right? Sometimes that was true. And like I said, in early America, some folks were actually able to buy ready-made quilts from Britain. So it's interesting, right? Remember what I said about looking fearlessly into all of this? In the 1850s, also, you had the, the beginning of the sampler quilts, or at least, you know, you had sampler quilts becoming really popular. The Baltimore album quilt on the left, this quilt on the right, I'm obsessed with it. I think it looks so contemporary. But yeah, 1850s, people still kind of fussy cutting and making their fabric last, but I don't know, you just have different shapes coming out, you know? There's this symmetry, there's this stuff going on that I think is really interesting. In the 1860s, you got the start of the Civil War. This quilt is a gunboat quilt. In the South, you know, the folks who were fighting for their, uh, for their succession, they were funding their own army. So th this is a gunboat quilt, and that was made by a group of ladies who they were raising money. It was a charity quilt, an auction quilt, to raise money for gunboats for the war. I mean, that's real life, okay? This quilt, I love this quilt. It's a Union Star. It's a quilt made uh, by a woman who was in the North, and I love how she put her name on it. She's like, this quilt was made by me, and I am 68 years old, and you will not forget it, and the world's going to know about it. And the world does know about it, Elizabeth, because you put your name on your quilt, and everyone should do that on the front or on the back you want to do but I love this quilt I think it's absolutely gorgeous this is the reconciliation quilt the last quilt here on our romp through the 1860s this is one of the most famous quilts uh, ever uh, the reconciliation quilt is about um, you know 
reconciliation after the war and just these scenes of American life in the 1880s. I mean, basically this quilt is just here to show you how much fabric was around. I mean, and the blocks that were being created and were being, I don't know, you could say invented at this time because people were messing around. They had all this fabric to, to use and the block style quilt really became a very American way to design a quilt. And you can get like emotional about it, that it's like one block working with others to build a greater thing and like log, log cabin quilts, you know? It's like, this is how we, we work together. We put one log down at a time and we, we make our nation and, and all this. So block style quilts are one kind of American quilt. Applique quilts are another, but it's this American patchwork quilt. Schoolhouse blocks, star blocks, monkey wrench, nine patch, four patch. This kind of stuff was really popping. It was popping. That's a baby quilt on the left. I don't know, somebody loved that baby. Somebody loved that baby a lot because that is a really hard Mariner's compass, compass pattern and it's very small. It's like 32 by 32. I don't think so. Uh, a little bit more political-ish quilts. I should say that's a pretty problematic term. We're going to talk about it later. Eagles, patriotism, all kinds of fun stuff. Do you realize that we are now at the end of our romp? We're going to close out our romp of quilts through the 1900s with the crazy quilt. The crazy quilt was made during the Victorian era. The 1890s were in the Victorian era and they were they were kind of crazy. This is a lady who is so, so bored uh, in life right now in this time in America. She can't vote and she's maybe kind of dissatisfied. Not all of the ladies were dissatisfied with their lives, but some of them really threw, their, threw themselves into making these crazy quilts and just filled these quilts with all kinds of shapes and wacky patchwork and embroidery. Some people love crazy quilts. You, everybody can have their style that they like. They're not my favorite, but do I appreciate them? Absolutely. Whoa, we did it. I know I went fast. I know I went fast, but we still have the 20th century to talk about. So you're saying to yourself, if you know anything about quilt history, you didn't talk about like 90 things. Like you left out a million things. This is Queen Lily Yu Okalani, I hope I pronounced that at least a little bit right. She was the last queen of Hawaii and she was doing her thing. People were making these quilts and it was just a very interesting time in Hawaii, which, uh, you know, is like a huge hot hotbed of very special American quilt history. What about the Amish? I know, I know the Amish are so important to this story and I talk more about the Amish quilts uh, in another lecture. I told you, it's a brief history of the American quilt. I can't talk about absolutely everything, but yes, Amish quilts, very important. Amish folks in Ohio and in Pennsylvania and in uh, 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 Illinois, Ohio, um, Amish folks making plain quilts. Although I think the one on the right is not so plain. I think the Amish folks were going out of the box on that one. Interesting, kind of a crazy quilt influence there. Amish bar quilts. Um, this picture is also haunted. I have to talk about Harriet Powers. Harriet Powers Bible quilt. This is actually the second version uh, of the quilt that she made. Uh, Harriet Powers was a woman who was born a slave in 1837. She made this extraordinary pictorial quilt. Uh, the story is very interesting. This woman, you know, bought the first one. Harriet needed the money, and then the woman had her do another one that was like commissioned. I mean, it's a very, very interesting story. Uh, Harriet Powers Bible quilt. It's in the Smithsonian. We got to talk about it, right? So we're talking about it. But there's more to say. So go read about it. Read about Harriet Powers and her legacy. Very interesting stuff. The 19th century, we're done. We did it. Congratulations. That was a lot. I'm, t I'm exhausted. I better have some more coffee. Okay, but here we go. We're ready to hit the 20th century. Who could be more perfect than to like like to embody the 20th century and all of its complications and beauty than Frida Kahlo. So bring it, that's what Frida says. Let's do part three of a brief history of the American quilt. 1900s-ish, uh, really interesting stuff happening with quilts. Lots of patchwork, lots of colors, lots of, you know, people are playing with silk and they're playing with wool and they're playing with all kinds of things. And I just love the innovation that starts to happen uh, in the 20th century. Uh, with quilts, and this is so important also, is that the quilt as an object and patchwork as something you play with. I mean, there are really interesting parallels to draw between the, the art world, like the high art world, and the world of quilts. And don't even get me started on the art versus craft thing with quilts. Believe me, we're gonna go there. 
this is a brief history of the quilt, okay? We're not going to get too deep into like the philosophical differences between art and craft. It is one of my favorite things to talk about for now. It is for another day. It is for another episode of The Quilts Must Go On. This is Sonia Delani. Hope I'm saying her name right. She was a French artist. She never gave credit to quilters, to American quilters. She's French. Um, for some of her motifs and her work, but like, dude, she was all up in the patchwork and she made garments and she made, um, you know, yeah, textiles that were just straight up quilty, if you will. And that was happening in like the 1910s. So I just wanted to bring in like a non-quilt, uh, you know, thing, a non-quilt reference to show you that the American quilt was not just like a totally closed system. It was affecting other things. So also in the first portion of the 20th century, there was something called the colonial revival. And the colonial revival was a style. It was um, an aesthetic. Uh, people were interested in bringing it back to the basics, you know, basic American pride and like patriotism and all kinds of stuff. And it's kind of weird because like the colonies, as we know, not great. Early America, not so good. Really cold, bad, remember? So to say like, let's bring back all that all the good stuff about the colonies is strange, but the colonial revival, the, the first one, uh, did not did not really uh, tell the story like that. It was more about like um, simplicity and bonnets and Johnny Appleseed and all this kind of stuff. So so that kind of aesthetic informed like colonial house styles, you know, like a colonial style house, that's what that means. That's where those houses came from. And the quilts were also um, showing that same kind of, um, uh, you know, checkerboard, red and white quilts, checkerboard quilts, um, just very, a lot of quilts being made because it was a very colonial thing to do, right? To make quilts, wrong, you know that now. They weren't making those quilts in the colonies, but that's where the myth sort of began because people were like, oh, all those colonists making quilts, let's do it too. Crazy, right? But now you know better. All right, 1920s, I show you this quilt because it's interesting to show how quilts were reflecting the times. When I say that history of the American quilt is the history of America, it's really true. This is a quilt that sort of commemorated the Lindbergh flight. Those are airplanes, obviously. Quilts were reflecting technology. Um, they were reflecting what was in you know, the news in terms of like maybe political campaign quilts, which of course happened before. But you know, you can track the, um, the evolution of, of dye technology. I mean, in the 1930s, you start having more quilts with it, that particular green color. And that particular green color was a color that couldn't have been made before the dye technology was happening. Okay, so then, so let's talk about the 1930s, okay? Because this is an important thing. The 1930s, it was a lot, okay? There was a lot happening in the 1930s. Uh, yeah, kind of like the Industrial Revolution, mistakes were made, like stuff was not great. Behind the uh, flaming uh, little, this is fine dog, you've got uh, a dust storm. That is a car fleeing from a dust storm. You've probably seen those famous pictures by Dorothea Lang of the migrant mother. You know, there were people really living in abject poverty in a lot of places in this country. The stock market crashed, the dust bowl. Um, it, was, it was really hard times in America. And 25% of the country was out of work for years. And we're going through some really crazy economic times right now. And people talk about the Great Depression. Is this a new depression? It's, it's scary when you look at how, at how bad it got, you know, food lines and, uh, and all kinds of things um, happening at that time. And what's interesting is that the quilts of that time, it's hard to find a period of time where the quilts were more joyful and, and playful than in the 1930s. And remember, we said that if you don't have any fabric, you can't make a scrap quilt. By this time in America, there were enough textiles, even if they were secondhand, thirdhand, um, that you could still mess around with fabric. There were a lot of quilts in the 1930s that were scrappy. People used feed sacks. It actually happened a little bit more in the 1940s, but, but people were using textiles that they had. They were cutting up old dresses. They were cutting up um, fabric that had out lasted its use um, to make really, really interesting um, um, scrap quilts and really interesting quilts. And they were making quilts like the grandmother's flower garden quilts, which are iconic for the 1930s. That's that green I'm talking about, right? That's that very interesting mint green color. But um, cheerful quilts, um, quilts that just made people happy, frankly, trip around the world there on the right. And in the Century of Progress exhibition in 1930, Three, there was uh, the Century of Progress World's Fair in Chicago. And in the World's Fair uh, announcement, the 
fair organizers said, there's a quilt contest that we're going to do. Sears sponsored it, very smart Sears here based in Chicago. They said, we will, uh, we will award huge cash prizes for a quilt contest. They got 25,000 entries. And the, the, um, the fair organizers said, if you work in the theme of the World's Fair this, this, uh, this time, which is the Century of Progress, that was the theme, then you'll get extra money. So you have some of the most extraordinary, iconic, weird, exceptional, bizarre quilts in America, I believe, happened in the 1930s because people were trying so hard to be innovative. Um, they were trying to win that money. I mean, you were talking about desperate people. You could buy a kit home with the money that they were awarding. I mean, it was like $1,200 or you know, $1,500 with this extra prize money you could get. So you had these just wild, there were no rules. People were making crazy looking quilts, beautiful quilts in the 1930s specifically for this contest. And there's a great book by Mary Kay Waldvogel and uh, Barbara Brackman about this. Check it out, I'll have it um, in, in some information I can give you later. Okay, 1940 to 1960, what's happening? A lot of people say, oh, there was nothing happening with quilts from 1940 to 1960. The reason people say that, that there was this fallow period in American quilt making between like 1940 and 1960, it makes sense why they would say that. During World War II, women went to work for the war effort, so there were fewer women at home doing quilts, right? Okay, so that was one part of like the dearth of quilts. There were fewer quilts being made during this period because of these reasons. The other reason uh, being that the 1950s came along post-war and people were like, I'm never making a quilt again because I don't want to think about that horrible time that was the Great Depression when we were starving and like sharing a bathtub. I don't know. And they had new technology, right? The 1950s. You had sheets that you didn't have to iron. You could like buy floral printed sheets. And this lady looks like she is really into her sheets. Um, there was there. Oh, and this, I had to put this in there. That is a gas powered iron. Yes, that's right. Gas. I don't think you should use that. And I don't think anyone should, but that was a thing. So there's all this new technology and people are like, quilts, those are old fashioned. I don't wanna do that. I'd rather buy a blanket. And there was more money for some people to do that. So quilts didn't get made in the numbers that they were being made before. But the quilts that were being made are so interesting. During this time period, you have innovations. You, it's kind of a, a, a part two of those really cool century of progress quilts that we saw. Um, there are new blocks being formed. There are yeah new designs like the quilt on the left. So interesting. So for, full of personality. I don't know. The 1940s quilts are just like they're funky, man. Uh, so when you find them, they're really exciting. Quilts made out of polyester. Yes, there's these new textiles coming out. Coming out. Uh, there's polyesters coming out. Check it out. Um, pink and weird hot orange colors. This quilt is a work of art. You find fabric, maybe it's a gas station <laughs> branded fabric, and you put it in a quilt. In the 1940s, there was just this really interesting stuff happening. These everyday quilts, denim being used, uh, jean material, uh, scraps from dresses, from feed sacks, things like that. These quilts are, yeah, unexpected, and you, they look a lot different um, for a number of reasons from the quilts that came before. Okay, and there were other quilts being made. Sometimes people get upset because they're like, hey, in the 1940s and the 50s, there were quilts being made that weren't like, you know, just wild and crazy. Like, you know, there were nice, lovely quilts being made, you know, also. And so we give a nod to all of the kinds of quilts being made at this time, you know, victory quilts, uh, um, patriotic quilts have always, always been there. Uh, Bertha Stange is the lady who made that quilt crazy. I saw that in an art museum. It's in the Art Institute. That patchwork is ridiculous, okay? So all kinds of different quilts being made at this time. If you want to like be a quilt scholar and like pick a subject, there's a lot more work to do during that time. So take a look. Okay, in the 1960s, you gotta buckle up because here, it's like, this is where we take it home, okay? And you've done a great job with American quilt history. You've really done a good job. So buckle up, okay? Because this is a ride that we don't get off of until the end. <music> The second American quilt revival began in the 1960s, and that is John Mayer. And I, just like Vince Vaughn, I found John Mayer draped in a quilt, and I decided 
to put him in the show. Okay, so the second great American quilt revival is so called because remember the colonial revival? Remember how I mentioned that? That was like a big quilt revival in this country. And so the one that happened in the 60s and 70s is really kind of the second one, all right? So part one, the Freedom Quilting Bee. This is a picture from Boykin, Alabama, okay? Uh, G's Bend, Alabama is how the, the town is known. This, um, this period, this moment in quilt history uh, is a very important moment. It is a, it is a pivotal moment. The G's Bend quilts, the quilts of G's Bend, Alabama are very, very famous. I talk a lot about them in, my, uh, in the episode on myth, the, the myths in the American quilt story. So definitely check that out. You will learn a lot about the Freedom Quilting Bee and the quilts of G's Bend. But the quilts in G's Bend, Alabama that were being made like in the early 20th century and, and they're still being made today, but there were particular quilts uh, at that time in the 40s and 50s and 60s that were being made by quilters down there in Alabama that were really special and they have a very uh, intense story. These are quilts that came out of G's Bend, Alabama and the Freedom Quilting Bee, which was a collective of quilters who were making these extraordinary quilts uh, down there in G's Bend. These quilts were captured, um, they captured the attention of the art world in New York and so quilts from Alabama were being like sold at auction in New York City, New York City, and they were, quilts were starting to be noticed. This is the point. They were starting to be noticed by the masses in a way that they had not been noticed in that fallow period, right? That so-called fallow period that came in the 40s and the 50s. So the 60s, stuff starts heating up for quilts. Part two, the Whitney show. Very important moment. Almost like a watershed moment. Almost like everything changed with this show. That's the Whitney Museum of Art in New York City. They have since changed their building, but this was where, this was the location of a very uh, important quilt show. In 1971, Jonathan Holstein, he's the one with the mustache, and Gail Vanderhoof. These were two young, you know, young folks, art people in New York City, and they loved quilts and they collected quilts. They amassed quite uh, the quilt collection and they were connected art people. And they started, uh, Amish quilts were a big part of their collection. Uh, these are some quilts from the uh, Holstein and Vanderhoof collection. They, they had these quilts, and this is like the late 60s, okay, and the early 70s. They took these quilts to their fancy art friends at the Whitney Museum of Art. Um, you know, I'm telling the abbreviated version of the story. And they showed these quilts to the curators there. And the curators were like, uh, what? Like, these are pretty cool. Like, they are very interesting. They look like abstract art. They didn't really see them in terms of them being quilts. Um, that's a whole kind of thing. It's kind of problematic and interesting. We'll talk more about it later. But they were looking at the design elements of these quilts and to them, to the art people at, you know, at the Whitney, this was a revelation. They couldn't believe what they were looking at. And so they said, yes, let's put up a show at the Whitney of these quilts and we will call it abstract design in American quilts. And we'll put the quilts on the wall like paintings. We will treat them essentially as abstract paintings, but it's cool because they're quilts, right? This was a huge deal. It was a huge hit. The show, which was kind of thought that it was going to be like maybe kind of a sleeper, you know, they were excited about it, but they thought they're quilts. How many people are really going to come and see this show, really? Well, a lot of people came. They lined up around the block. The show was extended and extended again, I believe, and uh, quilts became really cool. Uh, they were so cool. This show toured the nation. Uh, this show went to Japan. Uh, there was just a lot of interest in this particular show and it changed, kind of changed everything for quilts in America. And one of the ways that it changed the quilts um, in America, the way we think about quilts in America, is that it, it kind of started that conversation in a, in a big way about our quilts art or craft. Like this is kind of like the, the turning point for that discussion, our, our quilts art or are they craft, okay? So that happened. The Whitney show was a huge part of that. And then also the other thing that happened is that there was a big backlash. There was a backlash from the second wave feminists, right? The feminists who were doing their thing in the 1970s. They were like, you made these quilts into abstract paintings. You shouldn't have done that. They're quilts and you took them off the bed, which is where they should be, and you put them on the wall and we're really glad that you think they're cool, but they're not 
they're not abstract art, they're quilts. And so they really felt mad that the quilt had been stripped of its most important um, element, which is that it was made by women and it was a domestic object. And basically they were like, you can't, you know, you're saying it can't be art unless it looks like a painting, right? So screw you, right? So we'll talk a lot more about that in the episode on feminism and quilting, which I can't wait to do. When that Whitney show happened, one of the things that came out of it is that you had artists trained in other media coming to see that show and seeing quilts possibly for the first time as art objects these quilts that they start so so we have painters and sculptors and uh printmakers right who were suddenly like oh damn i think i want to like play around with quilts it wasn't the only thing that led to the art quilt like obviously there were way more influences and so much more to talk about see my other lecture <laughs> But there were artists who started to look at quilts very differently once they saw them on the walls of a museum like the Whitney. Um, so they started to play around with making quilts expressly for the wall, making quilts that were never going to touch a bed. Um, maybe some of them would, but a lot of quilters, uh, quilt makers, started to play around with quilts as paintings, basically. And yeah, it didn't just start with the Whitney show. This is Faith Ringgold, the great, the mighty, the beautiful Faith Ringgold. Um, these are some uh, textiles that she's made. Uh, um, she was making quilts and, and art quilts, right, before it had a name, uh, before they were called that. And they're called many things, art quilts, studio quilts, 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 believe me, it's a very complicated topic. But um, the art quilt movement was really, our quilt movement as quilters sort of know it with all these like different embellishments and embroidery on quilts and quilts that have sculptural elements you can kind of look to the 1980s kind of as the time that that was really starting to to get hot the third element of the quilt revival in the 20th century was the bicentennial this was a really big part of why people started making quilts just they went bananas making them. The bicentennial, of course, being the 200th birthday of America, 1776 to 1976. And you have to think about the time in which this was in American history. Vietnam had happened. There was a lot of unrest. You know, Kennedy had been shot. Uh, I mean, in 63, but like it was it was a strange time. I don't know. You've ever been through a strange time in American history? I don't know. Just a hunch. Uh, so in 1976, you had some patriotism, you had a lot of activism, a lot of protests too, but you had people kind of wanting to get in on the American spirit. And so once again, as we know, people looked to colonial America and like early America um, and took their cues from that, that simple life, getting back to our roots and bicentennial quilts exploded because people were like, how do we like celebrate the bicentennial? I know we'll do the most American thing we can possibly think of. We will make quilts. And so you had bicentennial quilts. They are so interesting. People make quilts all over the place. These are women in Central Park in New York City uh, quilting their quilt. I don't know that this was a bicentennial quilt, but it was in the 70s that people started, young women, young women started making quilts for fun, for, for, I don't know. I mean, they were making them because it like made them happy. They were making quilts for their families, but they were also making quilts with this different layer, this different um, meaning to them. It wasn't just making quilts. It was like making quilts because they meant something. And that had to do with the art, the artists who were putting art stuff on the quilt. It had to do with the feminists who were putting like feminist like meaning into quilts. The quilts were just really getting interesting in a different way in the 1970s. Um, yeah, bicentennial quilts were being made by students in, in school, and they're just really interesting quilts. So the bicentennial had a huge part to play in this big revival of quilting uh, in the last quarter of the 20th century. Okay, and then part four, the big business of quilting, and it is big business. But once like Reagan came in, and like there was like the 80s like, money stock market deal before that kind of fell apart the quilt industry was born okay the bicentennial the revival everybody's making quilts and like some people were like you know we really wish there was a tv show that would help us learn how to make quilts or we wish there were more books about how they're how i can make a great quilt and so beginning at that time especially in the 80s starting late 1970s into the 80s you had the quilt industry explode, okay? The quilt shops that you know, they did not exist. 
in the 1970s. They did not. They did not. The books that you love, the certainly the internet stuff, but like the television shows you feel like have been on forever, none of that existed before like basically the 1980s. George Bonesteel, pioneer, fabulous queen. She had the first um, TV show on public television, lap quilting with George Bonesteel. The rotary cutter, people, the rotary cutter did not exist. People did not make quilts with a rotary cutter in ye old America. The rotary cutter hit the scene in the 1980s. It made making quilts go so fast because you no longer had to cut out quilts from like templates. You, didn't, you, know, you no longer had to use templates to cut out pieces. You could skip the scissors. You could like whiz along your fabric and cut out pieces of fabric to use in your quilts in like a fraction of the time that you used to be able to do it. I believe, and I'm not alone, that the whole long arm quilt industry, this, these long arm, these huge enormous machines we use to quilt our quilts, they are completely based on the rotary, the existence of the rotary cutter. Because what happened in the 1980s is that quilters started making more quilt tops than they could get quilted. So they had, we had to figure out how to get these things quilted because we loved making quilts so much because it was so fast and it was so fun. And so this huge industry started forming around fabric and around tools and around shows and magazines. And it was, it was really something. It was really amazing how quickly it happened, how thirsty, how ravenous people were for more stuff and more quilting uh, time and, and there were retreats and guilds being formed. Today, and, and that has carried on up through today, people, I mean, here I am giving you a quilt, a quilt show in 2020, so, you know, things are still, things are still kind of, you know, engaged in culture. We're not in a fallow period, no way. There are 15 to 18 million quilters in America today, roughly. Um, the industry, the quilt industry is worth about three and a half billion dollars a year. Numbers go from, you know, three to four billion, somewhere in the middle. And by the way, I looked it up, online dating, it's a three billion dollar industry, so. <laughs> I don't know what online dating is doing these days, but yeah, we're bigger than that. Okay, so we're just bigger than that, so deal with it. And <clears throat> Kelly Clarkson makes quilts. So, I mean, clearly, like, quilting is here to stay. But it's that last part that I wanted to talk about, how it's big business. And quilting has remained big business. It's a big industry ever since that quilt revival. Okay, so we're bringing it home. The modern quilters, this one's for you. In 2009, in Los Angeles, three ladies, three ladies, Elisa Haight Carlton, Latifah Safir, and Heather Grant started um, a little sewing group. They, they were uh, hip, and they were cool, and they were in LA, and they decided to make a quilt. It looked different than the quilts maybe that their mothers made, that their mothers might have made, or, or a friend's mother had made. These quilts looked more, how shall I say, Graphic? I think that's a fair word. There's a whole definition of what the modern quilt style is, and we talk a lot about that in my show, Modern Quilts, Roots and Frontiers, just like the art quilt. There's a lot to say about modern quilts, and I dedicate a lot of time to it in another episode. But the modern quilts take elements of traditional quilts and then add stuff that, like, is different. They use improvisational piecing on purpose, you know? They play with solid fabrics. They play with negative space. And these are things that have happened in quilts before, but they were given sort of a fresh coat of paint because of the Modern Quilt Guild. And those three women, Latifa and Elisa and Heather, started a movement, not even realizing that that was going to happen. Definitely not. The Modern Quilt Guild that started in LA has blossomed. There are Modern Quilt Guilds all over the world. I think 250 some in America alone plus more um, uh, in other parts of the world. They have QuiltCon every year since 2013. They have a huge conference where modern quilters come and they show their quilts and they party, we party, we have fun, we, uh, it's wild. Um, yeah, sometimes it is wild. A lot of the modern quilters are a little bit younger than the traditional quilting set. Um, the modern quilts are fabulous. This quilt was one of the, uh, the quilts, my favorite quilts that has ever been made. It's called Bling. It won uh, the 2017 Best in Show Award at the Modern Quilt Guild Show. Quilt con. It's obviously based on a princess cut diamond. That was the inspiration for Kat to make this quilt. Modern quilts are amazing. If you if you know somebody who thinks quilts are like, I don't know, floral and like boring, you just send them over to QuiltCon or you send them over to the Modern Quilt Guild uh, Best in Show lists of quilters who won at QuiltCon and you'll see quilts are qu quilts have changed. Quilts have changed, not all of them, but a lot of them, and they're really really extraordinary. I love the modern quilters. 
Yay. Okay, so that's it. We just got to today. Modern Quilters doing their thing. QuiltCon 2021. It's online. You'll know more about it later. We did it. It's a brief, a brief history of the American quilt. I know it wasn't that brief, but what do you want from me? I'm trying my best. I, I'm doing the best that I can, I swear. And you're still saying, but wait, wait, wait. You didn't talk about like 90 things. I know, I know I did not. How, how could I possibly, but I, you know, I didn't. I didn't talk about how quilts equal community. I didn't talk about how we gather together. I'm literally gonna cry. <laughs> how we gather together to make our quilts because they're so important to who we are as Americans. And no matter what kinds of quilts we make, whether they're fancy or they're everyday or they're bad, I make lots of quilts that look bad, I feel like, anymore because I don't make quilts enough anymore because I'm reading about history. But our quilts mean family to us and they mean, they reflect our best times and our worst times. And that's what quilts really are. At the, at the end of the day, they're blankets that mean a lot to us, right? Um, we didn't talk much about political quilts so-called political quilts. I mentioned them, but the political quilt, it's a very complicated topic. You know, people make political quilts for lots of reasons. The AIDS quilt, the biggest quilt that's been ever been made, it's 54 tons. If you want to know a lot more about it, the AIDS quilt, guess what? An episode of this show will tell you all about it. We didn't talk about emotions. Emotions. There are mourning quilts. The one on the left, or the one on the right, Nancy Butler, that is a child's quilt that was made for a child who died. We're talking about quilts that are made uh, with messages of hope and, 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 you know, emotions, right? That's, that's part of this too. I almost cried earlier. So, so we could say a lot more about that. We also have to give major props to people who don't make quilts at all, who are part of the story, the historians. We gotta have you. We gotta have you. Quilt researchers, people who write books about this stuff. The, form, uh, the, um, the late quest of Benberry, uh, you've got Carolyn Aslumi, you've got Barbara Brackman. We need these peeps. And those people, all way more talented than I am at um, quilt history, but I don't know, I love this stuff, so you're stuck with me. We need the collectors. If those people don't collect quilt, if those people who can don't keep these quilts safe, I have no quilts to show you, right? We need our museums. We need the International Quilt Museum. We need Rod Kirikoff. You know, we need these people who, who keep these quilts safe. And like, there's a lot to say about collecting, you know? What does that mean? What kind of problems arise from that? You know, what kind of really great things come from that? When I say quilts are complicated, I mean it. No, we didn't talk about fashion. I mean, yeah, I could talk about quilts and fashion all day, but guess what? We don't have all day. <laughs> we don't even have time for the Kardashians. We're going to have to talk about the Kardashians later. I know, it was a scandal. It was a scandal. This came out a couple years ago. I think it's fabulous. We'll go there. We'll go there when we talk about modern quilts. You did it. <laughs> you did great. You know a lot of stuff now. You know a lot of things. And you can watch this back through again, if you can stand it, um, and learn and, and, and just ask yourself, you know, what part of this talk interested me the most? And then you can go and read a little bit more about it. Or you can go, if you're a quilt maker, you can go find the time of American quilt history that you love the most and let those quilts inspire you in your own quilt making. So remember what I said at the top of all this whole thing, keep looking, keep looking at quilts in your communities, in your own families, keep looking at quilts that came before you because they have a lot to tell you. That was a brief history of the American quilt. Join me for other episodes of The Quilts Must Go On with me, Mary Fonz. Bye. Thank you.